Hey, what's up everyone? So as we know, the long-anticipated Yai Miko has been finally released today. So whether you're here because you're planning to pull for her, or because you just pulled for her and need a guide, this video is here to help you. I will try my best in this video to make it as short as possible, because Yai Miko isn't that complicated as something like Shogun, Zhongli, or Albedo. So if you need to get to the important parts, I've put timestamps in the description and in the pinned comments so that you could just skip through it. Or you could just relax, sit back, and watch the video as it goes by. Today, we'll be going over her skills and attributes, weapons, artifacts, stats, constellations, and finally team comps. Also last thing, this video took a good amount of time to make, so if you could drop a like or even sub, that would help me go up in the YouTube algorithm. Anyways, let's get into the guide. Now, when it comes to the normal attack, skills, and burst, we'll be assuming that all of them are level 9, since that's the breaking point for all skills until a crown is needed to level them up. So let's start off with their normal and charge attacks. Her normal attacks have decent multiplier from 67, 65, and 96% damage respectively on the first, second, and third attack. But what's more interesting is her charge attack and its animation cancelling. Not only do you hit 242% damage every time, but it's also a multi-hit charge attack, which means that the larger the enemy, the the more damage your charge attack will do to it. Reason being because your charge attack is a series of small thunderbolts that strike forward every time. And like I mentioned, this can be animation cancelled. If you jump at the perfect time while casting the charge attack, you will be able to spam the hell out of it and just being able to abuse its damage. Even using it on small enemies in a straight line or while they're being sucked in by Venti's ult does a ton of damage. So all in all, I'd recommend you upgrade the basic attack to level 6. It's pretty fun to use and powerful in certain situations. Next up is her skill. This is undoubtedly the best part of her kit. While casting her elemental skill, she dashes forward and places down a Seshul Sakura. For this video, we'll be calling it the totem. So you have three totems to start off with. Because of this, you can press your skill three times and summon three totems at once. These resonate very well with each other. Very good news as well, the duration of each totem is independent of 14 seconds, while the cooldown for a single totem takes 4 seconds. To put this into simpler terms, that means you have 100% uptime for your totems. Now, this is what makes the totems interesting. The more totems on the field, the higher damage each totem will do. But keep in mind, the totems will have to be near each other for this effect. To visually show what I mean, the first totem that I casted will do 103% damage. When I cast the second one, both totems now do 128% damage. But when you cast all three together, they now all do 161% damage. They directly level up each other every time you put them next to each other, which is going to be important when we get into the constellation section. They will each take turns and periodically attack enemies while generating electro energy particles. But the elemental skill does not stop there. So before we talk about the burst, let's talk about one of our passive skills. For every point of elemental mastery that Yaimiko has, her totems will do an increase in 0.15% more damage. To put this into perspective, if you have an average elemental mastery of 50 on your Yaimiko, your totems will get a 7.5% damage increase. Keep in mind that the elemental mastery not only helps the totem damage, but also increases the damage of electro reactions from your Yaimiko which is a win-win situation. We'll talk more about this in the artifact section. Now, let's talk about her burst. It's a very straightforward burst that does AoE electro damage, but this is where your totems come in again. If you cast your burst while you have active totems on the field, they will be removed and sacrificed to create a thunderbolt. To start off, when using your burst without any totems, you release an initial thunderbolt that does about 442% damage. But then, each totem that is sacrificed will create an additional thunderbolt, which does a whopping 5 567% damage each. So if you have only one totem on the field and use Yaimiko's burst, you will have Yaimiko's original thunderbolt plus one totem thunderbolt. This is a total of about 1000% damage. But if you have three totems on the field and use your burst, you will have Yaimiko's original thunderbolt plus three other thunderbolts which do 567% damage each. This is about 2150% total burst damage. For comparison, Child's burst is considered to be one one of the strongest single hit bursts in the game, which only does 788% damage. And for argument's sake, let's just say Child hits a Vaporize and does double damage. That's still about 500% less damage compared to Yaimiko's burst. So just know, Yaimiko's burst is one of the strongest bursts in the entire game. But there's no good without a bad. Yes, the burst itself does a lot of damage, but the cooldown is a stupidly long time of 22 seconds, while the energy cost of it is 90. By the way, that is the highest burst cost in the whole entire game 
game alongside Shogun. Also, you may be thinking that the burst is not optimal because you're sacrificing your totems. For our next passive skill, we have this. Every totem which is destroyed gets its cooldown reset, which means that right after using your burst, you can replace all the totems back on the field. So pretty much, never be scared to use your burst. And every time you're about to use your burst, make sure you have three totems on the field so you can get the most optimal rotation and damage. As for the last passive, pretty much if you're creating a blue book from Inazuma, you have a 25% chance to get a different type of blue book that's also from Inazuma. For example, creating a guide to light has a 25% chance to creating a guide to transience or guide to elegance. Likewise for Liyue, Mondstadt, and any other region that should be coming in the future. So when it comes to weapons, Yai Miko is very free to play and low spender friendly. For her best weapon in slot, we obviously have her signature weapon, the Kagura's Verity. It has a decent base attack with a lot of crit damage, but also every time you cast an elemental skill, the damage of Yai Miko's elemental skill are increased by 12% for 12 seconds. And this can be stacked 3 times. You know what else can be stacked 3 times? Yai Miko's skill. And while you have 3 stacks active, you gain an additional 12% elemental damage bonus. So obviously, this weapon was tailor made for Yai Miko. But is it worth pulling for? The answer to that is no, because her second best weapon is something most people have, and it's the Wit Sith. This weapon provides an average base attack for 4 star weapons, and just like the Kagura's Verity, gives crit damage as a substat. The thing that carries the Wit Sith even further is its passive skill. At Refinement 5, when you enter the field, you can either get 120% increase in attack, 96% increase in elemental damage, or a 480 flat elemental mastery increase. But don't forget what we mentioned earlier. The increase in elemental mastery is a win-win situation, which means no matter which buff you get, you will benefit a lot from it. One of these buffs can be triggered every 30 seconds and last for 10 seconds. Next, I'll throw in weapons that were close, but not as good as the last two. These weapons being the Solar Pearl, Black Cliff Agate, Mappa Mare, Hakushin Ring, Memory of Dust, Oath Sworn Eye, and the Skyward Atlas. Keep in mind the Mappa Mare and the Hakushin Ring are both craftable, while the Black Cliff Agate is bought with Stardust in the Paimon's Bargain Shop. Lastly, I'll include the Thrilling Tales. This weapon is usually used for supporting other units, so you can't go wrong with the Thrilling Tales, but just know that you'll be losing out on a lot of skill and burst damage if you choose to do so. So I may get the question, should I go for C2 Yaimiko or should I go for her signature weapon? My answer any day would be for her constellations. The Wit Sith is more than enough to carry Yaimiko into floor 12 with absolutely no issue. We're gonna talk about the constellations a little bit later in the constellation section. Next up is artifacts. First we will talk about what sets you should use, then talk about the substats that are optimal, then finally what main stats and stats you should have. I first want to talk about the Thunder Soother set, which is the most wild card option for her. If you're using it with a mono electric team that can include an animal buffer, or run a team that can consistently proc electro without getting overridden by any other element, the Thunder Soother is going to be your best set. Otherwise, don't use it. Instead, the best artifact set I found to be that's the most consistent is the 2-piece Thundering Fury and the 2-piece Shiminawa or gladiator set. This gives the most consistent damage as it not only increases your electro damage bonus but as well as your attack. The second best one would be to use 2 piece Shiminawa and 2 piece gladiator for a very strong total attack which can be multiplied further. Another really good set is the 4 piece Tenacity because your E skill is constantly damaging opponents which obviously supports your team by a lot as you can see from the 4 piece. The 2 piece Wanderers with something like a 2 piece Glad or Shiminawa or Thundering Fury is also not that bad. Or you could just go full force and run the 4 piece Wanderers if you're running a DPS Yai Miko. 2 piece Noblesse with Thundering Fury, Shiminawa, Glad is also pretty nice for the extra burst damage and just overall attack. And finally, we have the Emblem set. This is a problem amongst people who want to build Yai Miko. And the issue is that a lot of people have good Emblem sets because it's a good domain to farm, but fail to realize that this is the worst viable set for her as it only benefits her burst. Your burst will be doing a lot of damage, but you're losing tons and tons of damage from your skill, which is the main damage dealer when using Yai Miko. It's best to run something like 2 piece Thundering Fury, 2 piece Glad to get the most damage out of your burst and your skill, rather than using Emblem which only helps your burst. So now that you guys have an idea, when it comes to sets, let's move on to the substats. In terms of substats, I have them in this chart ranked from best to worst. The top 3 substats that you need is crit rate, crit damage, and attack percent. The next two is honestly dependent on what you roll, and those are Elemental Mastery and Energy Recharge. Elemental Mastery for the extra totem and reaction damage, and Energy Recharge for the faster burst uptime. The only medium 
mediocre substat that's left is flat attack because it doesn't provide as much as attack percent. And finally, the useless substats are HP and defense stats. So let's make this part quick as it's the most simple to explain. The flower and the feather obviously have HP and attack as we all know without a doubt. The best goblet to use is the electro damage bonus one because it's multiplicative when it comes to damage. For the sands, you definitely want to use attack percent. This is where people get the question on whether they should use attack percent or elemental mastery. Without a doubt, run attack percent. It's much better to get that little bit of elemental mastery from your substats than your main stats. Not only does attack percent give more damage for your burst than your normal attacks, but you still do more damage from your totems using attack percent compared to elemental mastery. So honestly, there's absolutely no reason to run elemental mastery as of now, because electro reactions are the worst in the game. This may change when dendro comes out, but as of now, attack percent is the best sense to run. And finally, for the circlet, run either crit rate or crit damage. A good thing about Yaimiko is that her ascension stat is crit rate, which means that running a crit rate circlet with her will automatically put it at about 55% without any substats. So honestly, if you have something like the Witsit that gives crit damage, run crit rate circlet, or likewise for a crit rate weapon. The best crit ratio on her, just like most characters, is a 1 to 2. Try to go for something such as a 70 to 80% crit rate while having 160 to 200% crit damage. And lastly, we have her constellations. She's one of those characters that actually benefit a lot from each of her constellations. And just like Raiden Shogun, there's not a single constellation on Yaimiko that is garbage. So starting off with her first constellation, there's a very big misconception because people think that her burst only restores 8 energy for her. But if you read it closely, every time when you use your burst and a totem is sacrificed, then you gain 8 energy. So just like we said earlier, you want 3 totems on the field and then using your burst, which is a total of 24 energy restored for her. To put that into calculation, that's 26% of your burst restored. Next there's her C2, which I like to consider as two constellations in one. First thing is that the attack range is increased by 60%, which is amazing considering that there are fast and far moving enemies in the game. And the other thing that it does is what we mentioned earlier in the skill section, using all three skills together directly level up each other and do more damage. And the first totem that you use at C0 is level 1, but for this constellation, the first totem that you use starts at level 2. Two, which means that it can be level up two more times by your other totems for a total of four levels So if you have three totems connected to each other instead of your totems doing 161% damage each at constellation zero at constellation two They do an amazing 202% damage each to put this into Uga Booga terms Yaimiko constellation two equals more damage with totems and more totem range C3 increases totem levels by three for her C4 every time your totem deals damage to any opponent Everyone on the team gains 20% electro damage bonus. Pairing this up with Raiden Shogun, Fischl, or Kujo Sara would be amazing. C5 increases burst level by 3. And finally, C6, your totems ignore 60% of the opponent's defense. To put this very simply, if you have C6, you'll be hitting astronomical numbers with your totems. Finally, we get to the team comp section. For this, we'll have two sections. First, I'll be recommending the teams that are good with the Thunder Soother set and teams that are good with the other sets that I provided. So anyways, first team is very obvious, just running a straight up mono electro team that consists of Sara, Shogun, Fischl, and Yaimiko herself. Just make sure that if you're running four electro members, do not use Beidou and Shogun on the same team. Next, I find the most beneficial and actually tested this team, which was very fun. Using two of the three electro units that I just recommended, but with the animal defense shredder, such as Sucrose or Kazuo instead of the fourth member. This will keep the electro proc, but also shred electro resistance of the enemy. Next up is the same three electro characters, but instead this time you want to use child. Not only will you get a lot of electro charge damage, but keeping the electro proc will be absolutely no problem at all. Another is child, Singcho, Yaimiko, and another electro unit, which can include Beidou this time. A team consisting of child, Singcho, or Mona, Yaimiko, another animal support, and another electro unit is also pretty good. By the way, once Ayato is released, you can play around with these teams that require Hydro units and see what you can replace if you'd like. And finally, using 3 Electro units with the Pyro Archon himself, Bennett, is undoubtedly strong. Next up is her teams without the Thunder Soother set. I like to say this first things first, Yaimiko works extremely well with Raiden Shogun. Not only because of the high costing burst which helps both of them, but also amazing energy restoration from the Electro Synergy, Shogun's burst, and Yaimiko's totems. Having these two members on the team means you'll never have to worry about burst 
uptime, and you'll be doing stupidly high electro damage numbers. You can pair these two with Sing Cho for the consistent hydro damage and support. Xiangling as well with the pyro damage and support just like Sing Cho. Using Bennett is also pretty nice and using Child and Hu Tao just for a sub DPS. And if for whatever reason you don't have Raiden Shogun, that's completely fine. I'd say that treating Yai Miko is the exact same way you should treat an Albedo when it comes to team comps. Plop down your E skills and whenever your burst is ready, use it. So using her with the Xiao main DPS team is also very nice considering that she will be doing damage regardless of whether Xiao is plunging or not. And if you want to run a Eula main DPS team as well, that's fine because of the consistent superconduct. Something like fireworks comp of Yoimiya, Bennett, Sing Cho, and Miko is also very fun and strong from what I've tested. And people are going to enjoy taser comps more than ever considering the fact that Yai Miko not only does a lot of electro damage but also consistently procs electro. Something like Kokomi, Sing Cho, and Fischl with Yai Miko is going to be a very fun taser team. Yai Miko can fit into most teams as long as she's an off field or sub DPS. And just in case anybody wants to play main DPS Yai Miko, I'm going to include a couple of teams. One I found fun to play is the Raiden National team, but instead of Raiden Shogun, just replace her with Yai Miko. Sing Cho, Kokomi, Yai Miko, and Zhang Li was also very fun because that's also just a bunch of electro charge numbers and of course Zhang Li for the support. Yai Miko, Sing Cho, Zhang Li, and Albedo is also pretty good because of the geo resonance and constant off field damage. And the last one I can recommend is Yai Miko, Mona, Yunjin for the normal attack and damage buffs with something like Sing Cho or Zhang Li for the geo resonance. And yeah, that's all. So to answer the question of many people, is Yai Miko a must pull? Well, to answer that, it's a yes and a no. Yes, she's a must pull if you have Raiden Shogun. They work extremely well together. And no, if you don't have Raiden Shogun. Reason to that is because Raiden Shogun is one of, if not the best characters in the entire game, which I would rank SS tier. On the other hand, I would only rank Yai Miko S tier. By the way, if you guys want a full in-depth guide to Shogun, I'll put a link in the description and in the comments for that. But as far as how good Yai Miko is, she's definitely not a meta changing character, but she can definitely make some teams very powerful and more fun. And she has some fat ass titties. So yeah, this character is good for both simps and meta slaves. I'll repeat myself once again, if you don't have Raiden Shogun and can only pull one of the two characters, then pull for Shogun. But if you have Shogun and you're planning to pull for Yai Miko, go ahead and do that. Anyways, see you guys in the next one. Peace.